So let me, let, let's start this event. Can you see me, Manu? Yep. Hi, Javier. Okay. How are you doing? So this is, this is Manuel, Manuel Bedroa from Argentina. Manuel, let me read your introduction. So Manuel has worked as marketing director, a, a co-founder of Bitex, the first regional Bitcoin exchange that started operations in 2014 and which aims to build the first Latin American bank in Bitcoins, which currently operates in Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and Paraguay. Before founding Bitex, he worked at Accenture and Procter & Gamble, LATAM's digital marketing operations leader. Currently, Manuel is the co-founder and CEO of at Belo, that app. Also, we'll have Diego Gutierrez Saldivar. Diego was one of the pioneers of web development in Argentina and Latin America back in 1995 and has a leading role in fostering Bitcoin technology in Latin America since 2000, 2012. He has the ability to understand disruptive technologies and turn them into usable tools for businesses and social transformation. He started working with Bitcoin, Bitcoin back in 2011, and since 2012, he decided to completely devote himself to the creation of the Argentinian and Latin American grassroots communities. Also co-founded Rootstock, the first open source peer-to-peer -peer smart contract platform and payment network with a two-way pay to Bitcoin and Coinbox. Both, both companies aim to turn the transformative potential of Bitcoin into a reality. Diego is one of the founders of the Argentinian Bitcoin community with over 2,000 members and the um, founder of successful endeavors as Synergia, Cerocien, and other things. Diego has a, an, an extraordinary, extraordinary, um, extraordinary uh, back, a try, trail back of, of, of innovation. So the idea of this panel, while we wait, uh, uh, let me chat. Um, so the idea of this panel in Fineract is to discuss what is on the frontier, what is the next step of the financial, financial industry. So FinTech and, and Fineract are being uh, a great match in the last years and we are seeing in the fintech space a new trend, which is the decentralized finance. So Manuel, what are the DeFi? What are the decentralized finance? And can, how can you explain to the, the old traditional industry what DeFi is and why, and why it's important? So thanks. Uh, thanks. First, thanks for the invite. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, so to, to quickly go into your question, DeFi it stands for decentralized finance, uh, as you mentioned. Um, it means basically this idea of uh, creating money Legos. So trying to let's, let's kind of atomize all the different financial uh, products into different small parts that can be uh, composed in a way that we can build new type of uh, financial services or products by connecting all these parts, okay? So um, we have been seeing a really interesting trend since last year in Ethereum as one of the main, you know, uh, blockchains or, or networks where these kind of things are happening, where you can have, you know, uh, from automatic money markets to, uh, hi Diego, how are you doing? Um, to lend, lending platform, borrowing platforms, everything uh, built in a way which is decentralized, uh, which uh, doesn't require any KYC to 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 operate. And the and the most interesting part is that uh, you can uh, automate it. You know, so you can build a service that can work in a like a smart contract uh, in an automated way. Um, without intervention of any human being, you know, and that's and that's one of the things, and and it's one of, and one of the things that uh, Diego will for sure be uh, interested in. It's 
it is accessible for everyone. You know, uh, you don't need to ask for permission to to enter, and that's I think it's a key thing about DeFi. You know. So Diego, why, why DeFi is important? I think if you think about the the traditional financial system, is the the it's based on on a group of intermediaries that have legal agreements among them, no, and and that is what led us to to having a global financial system. So so it was a, an evolutionary step, this intermediation and, and legal structure for the financial uh, services provision. And but it has limitations because it's uh, you know setting those agreements is very costly, and also the intermediation implies that you have centralization of value, no, of assets. So that centralization requires certain security models and, and the compliance requirements also exclude and, and the cost of operation also excludes a lot of people, like half of our population in the world is excluded from the financial system. And it's because the system reaches the maximum of its capabilities, not because it's mean and doesn't want to serve anybody. And what DeFi mm -hmm. is doing is rebuilding all those financial services on public infrastructure and, and based on, on decentralized blockchain uh, technology, uh, all the primitives or the fi financial primitives are being rebuilt on top of this new infrastructure where interoperability among people, among service providers, uh, it's defined by, by programming logic and not by legal agreement. So, so you have interoperability based on, on programming languages instead of legal contracts, no? So, so that concept on one side enables a level of interoperability that was not possible that, until today, and also creates a global financial system. Of course, this global financial system, this DeFi system needs to interact with the local uh, countries, with economies or the financial infrastructure of the local countries, so, so it needs to comply with the local regulation when it, when it crosses the borders. But more and more, we are seeing that some of the local systems are also transitioning into this new infrastructure. So we, they, they profit from having this interoperability. And so things like, to take this down to a very simple uh, example, is like now we have people lending money to people. So without an intermediary or the intermediary is replaced by a program, by a smart contract. That's a, the jargon we use. It's like it's a, a self-running uh, uh, self or automated system that, uh, you know, can, can get the money from, from one party and lend it to another party based on certain rules. And, and you know that the rules will be executed exactly as expected because it's an, running on an open blockchain so you can audit the, the functioning and, and see that it really behaves as expected. So that's the concept, it's just that. It's like all the financial systems that we have today, but running on a decentralized open uh, network. No? Yeah, sorry, let, let, me, let me add something there, which is interesting also. Yeah. Uh, we are seeing people lending programs, you know, or the other way around. So it's not just institutions uh, against people, people against institutions or people against people. It's, you know, a new kind of ecosystem where we can have a uh, new type of, you know, uh, transaction types, which in the past were kind of impossible because uh, right now uh, a user can transact directly into a, into a contract without intermediaries, as Diego mentioned, you know. Yeah, so, so you have people to machine interactions as well, no? So you can have yes. autonomous exactly. systems that handle money. And, and how the system, the, 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 the old system or the, the, the current financial system uh, relates to the new DeFi. So DeFi will bring things that today we don't understand or we just think that it's not imaginable, like sharing or lending software. But so for, for, the, for the like traditional financial institutions that you have accounts and you have loans and you have like derivatives. What, what are yeah. the, the, the relationship between the DeFi and the CeFi, centralized finance? I, I, from my point of view, uh, sorry, uh, I think that the, the whole concept 
around it, it's kind of similar because you will have the same services, but the opportunities maybe are quite different, you know, uh, because you also can, you know, um, transact <coughs> against others uh, very differently, which it's occurring today. So when you are, you know, I'm in Argentina, I will use an, a fintech. Most probably that fintech is going to be in Argentina only. Maybe now I can use a smart contract for lending, which is in the metaverse, you know. Uh, that's one part. And the other part is right now, some countries, some, some companies, some financial institutions are offering negative rates. And in DeFi, you can get, you know, a deal which is above 4% or 8% or 30% or a million percent. You know, that's kind of DGEN DeFi. But um, <laughs> what we are seeing is uh, financial institutions going into DeFi to, you know, manage their treasury and, and take advantage of these situations that are being produced in, in the market, you know? Uh, I think if you think of the financial services or the financial industry, it, it does like three main things. It's like it, it handles custody of assets, it does payment processing, and then risk assessment. And derived from risk assessment, you have loans, you have insurance, you have all, all the services that, that basically understand risk and, and based on that create financial products. What mm -hmm. this public infrastructure does is like it create, it commonly, I mean, turns um, custodial services and payment processing services into commodity services. It commoditizes uh, those services because in the blockchain, you can open a, uh, an account and it, you don't have to pay recurrent like maintenance fees. It's like your account is live as long as you want uh, without any recurrent fee. Uh, and payment processing moves from percentages of the transaction into a nominal charge that is based on the security of the network you are using, you will pay more or less. If you go to Bitcoin, you will pay maybe 50 cents to a couple of dollars. If you go to RSK, you will pay 20 cents from five to 20 cents. And if you go to layer three, what is called the off-chain solutions, you will pay a fraction of a cent. And of course, you are, the trade-off is you are sacrificing uh, security as you go up, and as you go down in cost, and you are gaining scalability. So there is a trade-off between that. So you will choose, depending on which kind of transaction you are using, you will choose one network or the other. But then there's no point on charging percentages for transactions because the security is what you are doing is paying for security. And so what the financial system can provide, and, and, and I think we'll need to readapt this new environment where custodial services and payment processing will be a commodity, the financial services will need to reinvent themselves and purely focus on risk uh, assessment. That is something that cannot be done you know, purely within a decentralized environment, because the risks that a blockchain can assess are the risks that exist within the blockchain. So external elements need to be also assessed by traditional means. So I think what will happen is that the whole financial industry will refocus on, on uh, risk assessment. And there is a lot of value to be provided in that, in that realm, because in the connection between the physical world and the risk you know, that exist on the physical world and this new digitalized uh, world that is being built. So it's like basically in, in that in interaction between the traditional world or the physical world and this digitalized economy is where traditional institutions and financial services can provide a, a lot of value because they can build the trust between the physical world and this digital world. But uh, that's like one element. Also, you were talking about like new phenomena that will exist only here. One thing is like now, for example, in the case of loans, as you have uh, loan systems that can actually save the collateral automatically, you have loan systems that are highly efficient. Because if I'm taking, for example, a loan collateralizing my Bitcoins, there's zero risk of default. On, the, on that system. So, so you have lending systems that are extremely efficient because they can actually execute you know, the, the, the debt instantly. So you can have very efficient loan systems. And that's why I think 
over time, crypto assets that are scarce, like that are kind of digital gold, will be more interesting for people willing to hold value for the long term than than other assets because they will be able to access to better loan terms thanks to these capabilities of automated loan systems no? so that's another yeah, factor so that we will see developing over time more mortgage loans will be something like the the the, the dinosaurs again <laughs> lending yeah. uh, like a, a digital asset like bitcoin or, or ethereum just yes it's it's exactly and, and you can imagine maybe. that will lead to other changes in society like people very likely will move from owning to to having access no from ownership to access mm -hmm. instead of like because very likely you will want to only have like digital assets that are, give you more more value in terms of the services of course we are talking about the population who can save no that is maybe 20% mm -hmm. of the population we still need to to think how to put all these tools to the service of those who cannot think on mid to long term savings no but in that context i think these digital assets will have a you know a preference over the more complex physical assets uh, mm -hmm. great so we what we see is like it's generating a new layer that is like a global layer of that 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 it doesn't care where are you based because it's just a layer over the internet And, and, and that is, it, it relates very well with the open source movement, which is like an open world movement and, and, and mm -hmm. everything that we are, every blockchain was created uh, on top of, of Satoshi's creation, mm -hmm. which is also um, open source. And, yes. and we are at, at the Apache Con and we are the Finerec and FinTech. That This is an open source platform. How, how can... How can a project like Fineract, which is an open source core banking application that basically, as you, as you explained, Diego, works on the risk assessment. Just we create accounts, we manage the KYC, we, we manage the loans, the loan management, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter with what are your, your, your collaterals, if they are a house or a Bitcoin, It is a collateral. It is an asset. One, it's a, it's a, it's a asset that is less liquid than the other, but it, it is an asset. And, 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 and how can these two walls relate? How a, a, a system that is think for risk management can work with this new decentralized finance? What are the opportunities that we need to address as a community here? Uh, I think I, I don't know, Manu, if you want to comment on it or otherwise I can, you know. Go ahead, Diego. Yeah, yeah, and I think from my perspective, one thing that these new technologies change is that, as I said, it's not only that custody becomes a, uh, becomes a commodity, but also that custody is distributed. Because the other thing is like when you have centralized models, and I think what we need to see is like Finterac integrating the, these like self-custodial models into it to actually focus on risk assessment and release itself from the burdens of, cust of custodian assets. Because when, when you work on centralized systems, you need to have very costly security systems because you have, your, you have to have your seven firewalls protecting the database where, where your, your funds are, I mean, the ledger, uh, where the accounts are recorded and everything. So what I see is if you have the best of the, both worlds, what do you, you would do is like, you know, integrate these non-custodial or self-custodial technology where users are in charge of their accounts. So account balances are managed with private public keys uh, in a decentralized environment and risk assessment is still done in a centralized system with traditional, but then you would have like the best of all worlds because you would have like good, very good inter interface to do the risk assessment and analysis. And then you will have the immutability of blockchain and decentralization of the asset custody of blockchain. So you can lower the operational cost a lot because then you can have as, you know, as long, 
you're distributing the security because basically even if you can access the the, um, the central application still the funds are controlled by the private keys that each user has in in its command so so you have the the control of funds and the validation will be done individually by the participants and not in a centralized environment so that would be where where i see that you know fintech and and systems like this can evolve into this new world like they can provide all the know-how that has been accumulated over the last decade in building MIFOS and, and Pinterag now, and you know, and, and then incorporate the best of non-custodial systems. If we manage to have that, then it's amazing because it's all, of, as, as you say, we have a fully open source environment. And I think open sourceness in the case of finance is a must, it's not an option because you need to be able to see how systems work and transparently to really trust a financial system like this. So, so I think in that sense, uh, if we manage to put these two things together, so we can have the financial system of the future, one that is fully auditable, that everybody can see how it works and, and trust it because you have full transparency and not uh, you know, the, the famous model of uh, security by obscurity that we have today in, in, in the finance world. So Yeah, <clears throat> and, I, and I think this open source nature, it's, it's kind of important, you know, for innovation and R&D, you know, research and development, uh, being able to, you know, having an open innovation scheme where, you know, teams, some people can see what is happening and contribute to making better services, better solutions, even in terms of, you know, risk assessment, maybe, you know, seeing what is happening in terms of the diligence that it's been uh, taking in place can help uh, get a better idea of what solutions can be put into place in order to tackle that problem you know uh i don't, I don't think that centralized uh <clears throat> institutions or closed institutions uh, are better at, at these kind of things maybe we need to just understand and develop how these uh open um new schemes uh can solve all these problems that we are lagging for the you know uh last 500 years you know so it, it's it's good to, to have all this open open source technology available um just a, a note for the audience uh, there is a place where we can put questions so if anybody wants to ask questions to manuel or to diego please feel free to uh ask any questions and, and, and or in the chat or in the Q&A part that you have on the right side of, of, your, of your platform. So I'm, I'm, one of the things of, that got me interested in this panel was to uh, take a, a look at what is the next thing that is going to happen in the financial industry. And, and, and DeFi is for sure something that is it's it's on the verge of the technologies and the verge of what is happening in in the financial industry and the blockchain and the and the bitcoin and, and the crypto economy also the, the, it's it's for me it's kind of a, a, a reborn of the of the um, uh, peer to peer lending system that that didn't succeed much. Uh, we yeah, have with like Prosper this... back in 2011, no, the, the yes. early attempt. Mm -hmm. or, lend, yes. or Lending Club, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, 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 they crashed with, with the, they crash with the, 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 the regulations and they crash and, and, and with, with the traditional banking system. But how, how, what are the next things? What are the, the, the things that we don't know yet, but we can grasp that is going to happen with decentralized finance? Manu, you want to start? Uh, I think one of the, the key problems that we need to tackle is identity. I think we need to figure out how we can, you know, um, trust uh, without trust you know, uh, kind of verified uh, without trust. 
um, it's one of the things that we need to, and, and without compromising privacy, you know, uh, I think that's privacy is one of the the key things that we need to, you know, uh, work on in order to um, have a safe future for the whole humanity. Because he who can handle, you know, all that data uh, in a good way, I think, can will be able to to provide a good solution. So identity is for sure one without uh, harnessing uh, privacy. Uh, obviously, credit without collateral is one of the the other, you know key problems to, to solve. I think there are kind of, and, and it's tightly connected to identity uh, because when you kind of get an idea of how much money I can lend Diego without Diego uh, needing to provide any kind of collateral, it's where you, know, you can start creating a really powerful new financial system which doesn't depend on a centric uh, or central institutions, you know, or close institutions. Um, and, and I think that the, one of the things that I feel most passionate about it's this thing that people will be, you know, the engine of financial services uh, in a way that if we reach maximum decentralization and everyone can lend or borrow from anyone, uh, I think that it's obviously one really good uh, solution to what we see in the past with uh, peer-to-peer lending and all these uh, fintech companies. Um, and it's well, one thing that will you know flourish uh, for sure because the opportunities that can you know uh, generate from there are quite quite powerful. You know? Interesting. Um, yes, I, I agree with Manu. I think, you know, I will say that the, the, well, I call this new phenomenon that started with Bitcoin and all the networks that are being created now, Ethereum, RSK, um, you know, and, and many others. I call it the internet of value because it's a, a, conceptually it's a network of networks for the store and transfer of value and interoperability is becoming stronger and stronger. So, so that original vision of a network of networks for the transfer of value is becoming a reality today. No, so um, I think that the the more important emerging pattern is the one that Manu was was sharing. That is the reputational base identity. Because if I can own my reputation, I can own the traces of my financial and social interactions. Uh, you know, I can use that as a collateral. No, over a period of a couple of years. I can I can create something that of value that that really will enable me to access to financial services and also to access to better markets because that's a key element to get out of poverty to be able to access to better markets as well. So I think reputational identity is at the core of the revolution of uh, of what the Internet of Value is bringing, and. And of course, it will have implications not only on the financial world, but also on the political world as well, because that reputation can be used to to also coordinate social activities, uh, you know, um, self-organize solutions for the problems of society. So I think, you know, self sovereign identity is, is key. Um, and And then what I think is what we will have is like, not so much of a like a big revolution, but like a peaceful revolution where what we will see is like money flowing from the traditional financial system into this new financial infrastructure because this financial infrastructure is is more open, more inclusive, provides better services. So it's a you know and 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 as we see that flow, you know slowly uh, uh, but steady over the next decade we'll see that we will have a globalized a truly globalized economy because if you think today our economy is basically bounded to the nation state economies like what we have is a patchwork of uh, different financial systems that are bounded to to nation states inter poorly interconnected 
but this new infrastructure is global by design. So if we add this global design or open global design, uh, plus the reputational identities in the hands of people, uh, we have like, like a truly global financial system. And the other thing that I think is key is the other thing that Manu mentioned, privacy. I think with the digitalization of money, people it's not aware, but we are creating huge databases where we are, you know, putting together all the movements, economical movements, and, and our economical movements tell a lot about who we are, what we do, who we relate to. So if we are not careful, these uh, digitalized financial systems can become uh, tools of control for society. So I think the only, the only system that has a good balance between letting the, the police uh, forces do their work or the, the, you know, the, the um, judicial system do their work, but protect privacy is blockchain. Because if you, mm -hmm. in blockchain, you can have traceability, but obfuscate, you know, detailed data in a way that only through forensic work, you can actually, you know, yeah. get the information you need in case of a crime. So, so it's a very good balance between like allowing the law enforcement uh, to do their work, but protecting people's privacy and not creating systems that can be used to, to mass surveil and, and control the population. So I think that's the other thing that these new technologies are bringing that is not so present for people today because people is not so aware of the value of privacy. It's like we give that kind of for granted with exception of certain situations we have, like what we have with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. It's like there are some wake up calls, but people is not aware of the importance of privacy yet. Yeah, so. and one, one, let, let me let me add some some one point there, which we we are uh, hearing a lot lately, at least in the financial sector, which are CBDCs, you know, these central bank digital currencies. Um, we need to, I, I, personally speaking, uh, we need to be um, very very careful about this because um, you are providing a lot of power to you know central banks uh, by monitoring everything that you are, are being transacted you know you are transacting um, and even uh, and, we, and in countries like Argentina where you know uh, we we suffer of inflation by you know printing money uh, giving governments you know the ability of uh, making money uh, have an expiration date uh, it's kind of you know uh, dangerous also, and and also you know in terms of privacy, you know being monitored uh, by every single transaction, it's something that we need to uh, figure out how we can um, solve. In that regards, decentralized uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, let's say, give you a lot of information in terms of what is happening. But not without, and but without, you know, providing the, the identity of the person, which at the end of the day, it's what what we win, what we should be worrying about, you know, to 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 to, to save yes. at some point. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's an interesting thing because now with the, you know, money, it's 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 a way of it's a tool money it's a way of collaboration how we collaborate and 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 until now collaboration was made on on the nation states because we we use the the our local currency or maybe some international currency but with the centralization you have bottlenecks that are uh creating uh, uh, uh just a delay on on collaboration but with this new uh, layer that is global, that was born on the cloud, it, it's a cloud-based layer, there are no bottlenecks, mm -hmm. in and, theory. And, you and, have and also, bottlenecks, but... and also the, 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 the good thing about, you know, open and decentralized is that aligns incentives, you know. So um, mm -hmm. if everyone can, you know, be part of or, or mm -hmm. make, a, a, make money by, you know, giving or providing some 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 money as a as a collateral or, or borrowing uh, i think that aligns pretty, in a better way the, the incentives of being part of the system you know 
Uh, and right now that it's been, you know, only available to a really a small group of people that kind of, you know, rule the, the whole operation. So I think uh, being open, being decentralized, it's one of the, the things that we need to still push to, to make better financial services. You know? Yes, absolutely. Now, I always say that the, the, the traditional financial industry was based on, on the idea of a big safe, you know, where you put the, 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 <laughs> coin, the gold coins or the, or, the, or the paper bills. And, and, and that was like for 600 years. The, 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 the focus of the, of, the, of the banks and the financial industry was to, 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 to make a custodial, to be custodial yeah. of, of your Yeah, asset. it started as a custodial service. No, then it, yeah. it be, became something but, else. No, but, yeah. Now, now the, the, the financial institution should be a switch. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and enable you to, to cooperate. So that transformation it, it's 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 radical and, and, and it requires a, a, a change of mindset that is pretty difficult to, to execute in a in a short term period, but it's happening. We are seeing with open banking and and with other innovations and fintechs that are using this this product to, to be a switch, not not to custodial, but to allowed everybody to transact freely in the market. So uh, we are almost on time. Um, I know if you want to have like a, a, a couple of tweets for closing, Diego or Manu, if you want to give us final thoughts. Go ahead, you. Oh. Uh, well, I think it's like we are at a very, very special moment in humankind uh, we we saw how the internet we know today changed how we handle information and i think the open source movement is is a big part of that it's like we we the intermediate disintermediated the access to knowledge to to communications uh to opinion no we gave a direct voice to societies through the internet of information and thanks to to bitcoin and and decentralized blockchains we are now assisting to the disintermediation of the financial system and very likely in the future the political system uh, and as we know as we saw with each wave of innovation this brings more prosperity to society uh, more opportunities for human beings and i think you know the fintech community and the blockchain community uh, you know, it's, it has a, a big role to play. So I think we need to keep studying each other, <laughs> understanding more of each other, and uh, so we can build the financial system of the future. So that's my final reflection. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Diego. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, problems to solve still, and we need, you know, uh, to group as communities to you know, bring together all the skills needed. Um, I think there, are, there is a lot of resources out there. Uh, what there is, uh, there is people missing, you know, there is uh, technical skills needed also to solve these problems. So I think if you're looking to uh, make a journey into DeFi, definitely there is a really interesting community to start building. Uh, there is a lot of really interesting people also to work with. Um, so we are waiting for you, you know. So <laughs> come along, and uh, thanks, yes. thanks, Javier, um, for this time also. Yeah, thank you very much, Javi. You're welcome. Thank you for, for your time and to to share what is happening on the on the edge of this industry. And mm -hmm. hopefully, we can, as a community, just start thinking on how we can contribute with the decentralization and 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 the and the new economy so absolutely <laughs> see you see you over there and see you bye we have in, bye bye we have a, another panel in eight minutes another talk sorry about ai so let's uh let's see you there okay. amazing bye Ito. bye Javi. bye 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 bye